Hello and welcome to this, the final session of the four part series of the history of Grace Baptist. I'm Tamara Phillips and I have worked the last two years researching the history of the church and talking to members and former members and this study school session the last four weeks has been based on that research. So I'll do a quick review and then we'll jump into the chapters that we're going to cover today. So we first talked about why we study history. And there's a lot of reasons uh, that come top of mind why you study history. You learn from it. Um, you don't wanna repeat the mistakes of the past. <clears throat> it also inspires us and maybe gives us ideas on how to walk in the future. It gives us a closer walk with God. This is a church history. And also the Bible directs us to study our past. And those are some Bible verses there for you to look up. Then we talked about the goals we would like to have for this Sunday school class. I uh, want the congregation to learn more about our history. And so it can help direct where we're going, also inspire us and maybe an easier way, way to share our faith. I gave you a little bit of background on why I got the inspiration to write this book from conversations years ago with Bob Fell and all that he had in his memory and he passed away at 103 years old, for those of you who didn't know, our church office assistant. And, um, but I was just too busy at the time and working and had teenagers at home. So uh, it wasn't until the January of 2020, we were at a service for Larry Davis's daughter who had passed away. And I sat at a table with a lot of former members, uh, not former members, current members who went to the church downtown and such wonderful memories were being shared. Um, that I decided it really was uh, an opportunity for me to get busy with this. I felt God's nudging to start working on this. And then my own son came back from Southern California and finished his degree at Temple and walked the stage at what used to be our church and is now Temple Performing Arts Center. So here are the chapters of the book. The last few weeks we've covered, um, of these 18 chapters, we've covered the first 14. And so we're going to cover the last four today. And these are the content chapters. So in between those content chapters, of, as I spoke to you on other sessions of this uh, series, is um, I got so excited when I was doing the research for this about who the people were who came to our church in the early days in Victorian Philadelphia and who they were when Martin Luther King spoke in our church. Who were the people that went to our church and who were the people when it dwindled down to just <clears throat> a couple of dozen that were meeting in the uh, chapel of the four chaplains, who were they? So I really got curious about that and decided um, for whoever writes our uh, history 150 years from now, I wanted them to know who we are at our 150th milestone. So I went around the congregation and I inter interviewed as many people as I could. And also a lot of former members stepped up and um, people gave me names to reach out to. So those stories are included in between those 18 chapters I just showed you are the 17 chapters of what I call the pews, which we haven't gotten to. And I may spend a few moments at the end of today's session talking about. So this is the point I hope that people will walk away from uh, when they read the book is that God is there reaching out to us full of love and full of all of his promises. If only we'll listen and reach back out to him. Then I began the series on how we got started, and we were an offshoot of 10th Baptist Church in Philadelphia who decided to start a mission in a part of the city who had not yet been reached by a church. And they started, and we met first in a rented hall, and then we got our first building, which was a tent. And it was not just in the old tent, but it was actually heated and um, had wooden floor. And eventually uh, we saved enough and built enough congregation till we started our first building. And this was it at Second and Burke at Mervine and Burks. I'm sorry. And this was the church that uh, our fourth pastor, the very well-known Russell Conwell came to. It was just being finished for a few years. We met in just half the building because we only had enough money to finish the first floor. But by the time Russell Conwell came, we had finished it. It's also the building that because Russell Conwell was so popular that uh, this church became so over full that members had to, we had to issue out tickets and members entered at the back just so that they could get in. And then we opened the door to the general population. The picture there, the church was de eventually demolished in 1969 and Temple put out up 
Gladfelter and Anderson Halls in its place. And then we built the landmark historic building, which is today Temple Performing Arts Center. And that's the picture here. And then finally in 1975, we moved out to our current location in Bluebell, which I go into in some depth today. Then we covered the pastors of, uh, in previous session, we covered the pastors. These are, are 11 of our 14 pastors. Our longest serving was Russell Conwell. He's the second picture on the top row. And our second longest serving uh, was Reverend Fred Lewis. He's in the center on the bottom row. And then we had three pastors who served 12 years. And those were Poling, Vroom, and Pastor George Hawthorne. And then we have a whole chapter on Russell Conwell because much was written about him. So he was quite an interesting character. He was a, um, he loved to preach. He preached to the farm animals from a very young age. And he even became as a young boy before he was able to enter the Union Army, he helped recruit enlist men into the service in his area in Massachusetts where he grew up. But he didn't immediately go into preaching. He grew up after he was in the Union Army. He became uh, oops, several different things. He was a lawyer. He was a newspaper man, a property owner. He, he sold property. He wrote for newspapers. He traveled uh, the globe. Um, I think I'm missing a few things. He was a humanitarian. And he was a biographer and a great orator. He was, as I said, he's a world traveler there in the center. He's in Ephesus in 1910. In the lower right-hand corner is a picture of Joan Frizzell's grandparents when they were getting married and her great-grandparents there on the right, the bride's parents, Enos and Viola Spare. Enos Spare actually met Conwell at the train when he first came to Philadelphia for the call to the pastorate. So, we talked about the story of Hattie Mae Wyatt and her 57 cents, a little girl who couldn't get into our Sunday school because it was so overcrowded. She ended up dying of diphtheria, which was rampant in the city at the time. And she left her 57 cents for the building of the church. And Conwell used that inspirational story to drive amazing fundraising and inspire our people, our congregants to give and give self-sacrificially uh, so that we could have a bigger church and meet the needs of all the children in the city. And then there was the story of Johnny Q. Ring and the sword, and we covered that in previous sessions. And then we covered in some depth uh, in a previous session, the founding of Temple University with the highlight that it wasn't just Russell Conwell who gets all the credit today for founding Temple University, but he did not found Temple University alone. He found it with the help of our congregation. There were years that if it weren't for the congregation and the congregation holding fairs and holding all kinds of efforts. Um, almost many of our sermons were about giving and giving again uh, in order to keep that university alive. Our congregants, our people, members from our church led those classes that were held in our basement and then expanded into our old building. And um, so it's important to know that it started as a Baptist university, but it wasn't, we started it, Conwell, and the church fully intended it not to be just for Baptists, it was started for all people. It was started for working people who couldn't go to university during the day. So there needed to be a way for working people who couldn't afford to just not work. Uh, and so that was the premise to help people get out of poverty and to improve themselves. Then there's, we covered in depth, Conwell's famous story, The Acres of Diamonds, and he gave this speech over 6,000 times all across the country, all across the globe, he gave it at the Taj Mahal. He gave it at Madison Square Gardens with over like 15,000 people in attendance. And all the monies that he earned, Conwell gave to Temple University to keep it afloat and to specific students to get their education. We talked about how the church has been God's hands and feet in the world. We started an orphanage in, Phil an orphanage in Philadelphia. We started um, three hospitals. Here we have pictured Samaritan Hospital and Garrison Hospital, but also there was a maternity hospital called Great Heart. And all of these became, eventually became part of the Temple University health system. Then uh, we talked about um, the chapel of the four chaplains last week and how we founded that. Our 
Pastor Daniel Poling's son was the one there on the right, Clark Vandersall Poling, and he was one of the four chaplains aboard the Dorchester when it sank February 3rd, 1943, in the second worst sea disaster of World War II. And these brave men gave up their own jackets and helped men find lifeboats as the ship was sinking and uh, were such an inspiration uh, to the men as they were floating around in the sea. And 200 of the 900 men were eventually rescued. Uh, but we built what is called the Chapel of the Four Chaplains in the lower floor of our church when it was located in the city. And it still exists today in the Naval Yard in Philadelphia. Then we talked about how we had a camp in 1922. We purchased land, acre, uh, some acreage of land in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and members helped to build these rustic cabins. And the people who had the opportunity to go to this camp have wonderful memories of their time at Temple Camp. Unfortunately, at, at some point, the church um, was having financial difficulties and the upkeep of the camp had become too much and it was sold. We talked about the, how women have been in leadership long before it was customary in churches, and we spent some time on that. We talked about the very um, significant part that music plays in our worship at Grace Baptist and some of our very significant leaders that we've had. And then we get to today, and this is what we're covering today. We're covering <clears throat> the move to Bluebell, our missions and ministries, the next chapter is what I call From the Pulpit, which includes some excerpts of sermons from not only some pastors, but also some famous people who've uh, stood behind our pulpit. And then the last chapter is the future. And then, of course, as I have done in the previous sessions, we'll take a few minutes towards the end to listen to um, the last section of the video that we put together. So the move to Bluebell. I'm going to follow my notes here. And what I didn't do today, which I'd like to pause a moment now, is to start us off in prayer. And the prayer I'd like to use is a portion from um, what Conwell gave at the dedication of the portrait of Hattie Mae Wyatt. Join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings of this church. Please be with the people of Ukraine. Help us to be your hands and feet in the world. Please be with those among us who are ill and grieving. Dear Lord, as Russell Conwell spoke, people have had the faith in you and they went ahead trusting in you and you followed us all the way. You have kept and protected us through every step with great care and the future is just as safe certainly as is the past. Amen. Okay, thank you. And uh, back to the move to Bluebell. So I'll start with 2 Corinthians 5.17. The old is gone, the new is here. So on October 5th, 1975, Grace Baptist Church of Bluebell opened its doors after 103 years in Philadelphia at Broad and Berks. <clears throat> 64 members came in 1975 and 10 still call the church home. So lots of factors. You can imagine how difficult it must have been for this um, wonderful congregation who had spent so many years in this majestic building in the heart of Philadelphia to decide that they needed to leave. So <clears throat> they wrestled over this, uh, but they had issues because the congregation, the membership had dwindled. Many people had moved out of the city into the suburbs. The building was aging and costly to maintain. So they brought in uh, the Philadelphia Baptist Association, which helped us create a survey. And we had to consider our options. Do we completely stop ministry and close the church? Do we sell the property? Do we uh, merge with another church or relocate? So it took five years of discussion, praying and planning. And finally, the decision was made. So we sold the property to Temple University and we purchased the five acres from Bud Corporation out in Bluebell. And the last service, interestingly, downtown was a service of a child dedication, which kind of symbolizes that there was still life remaining in the congregation. We moved to find a new life in the congregation, new stories, new ways of serving in a new community. 
So it's interesting that just a few years before that, on February 12th, 1972, we had celebrated our 100th anniversary in the city. And not hardly a year later, on in November 11th, 1973, we held the groundbreaking services out here in Bluebell. And Pastor Glenn Abbott, he was our 11th pastor in between the two Lewises, the Eric Lewis, the Irishman, and Pastor Fred Lewis. He officiated at the groundbreaking service. And the architect, interestingly enough, was John W. Anderson, who is current member, um, Barbara Longenberger's father. And he was the um, architect. And he has some description in one of our, I think in the dedication book for the church when we first opened. And he describes the design of it being very modular so that we could adapt over time. And if you notice the cornerstone on the building that we pass every day as we walk into the church, every time we walk into the church, it has the beginning dates, at the beginning of the church in 1872 in the city and the beginning of the church out here in Bluebell, 1975. Okay, of note, I, I spend some time in this chapter talking, describing the church building, but of note um, to us today, because most of us are familiar with the building, but I wanted to point out at the Visitor Center is that original pulpit that was in the church downtown. And Conwell had in, made into that pulpit a heart of an olive wood that was built into the front, and it was from an olive tree taken from the Garden of Gethsemane. So I thought that's pretty special. And we're reminded of not only Conwell, but of the many people that <clears throat> spoke behind there, not just from uh, our church, but also because our church was a large auditorium, Temple University used it for a lot of graduations and local high schools used it and var various events <clears throat> were held there. So some pretty amazing people stood behind that. I point out the stained glass piece that is there in the picture uh, up toward the title of the slide. And that stained glass piece was made from salvage glass from the church downtown. And it was made in honor of uh, a church member, Nick Flower, who died in a tragic accident at age 14. It was dedicated by his parents, who are members today, Gary and Joanne Flower. So that's a beautiful piece that we want to not forget its significance. I also talk about the beautiful wooden panel we've put there in the front of the church with its varied wood co colors, which reminds us of how much we very much appreciate the variety of people that come and are members of our church, the variety in ages and races and cultures and political orientation, and even sometimes <laughs> theology. So, um, and then I spend toward the end of the chapter, uh, a good bit of time talking about the stained glass, because I think it's one of the uh, most beautiful features of the new church, new 45 years old, I guess it's not so new anymore, but of our current church. So there's four panels, and this uh, glass was designed by Willett Studios, which used to be in Philadelphia. And it's um, a very warm palette of colors, and it was designed so that the morning sun, about around the time of morning services, <clears throat> would be shining, if it's a sunny day, would shine in on, through these windows. And there's four sets of four panels each, and they tell an important story about Christianity. And I also think there's interesting tie-ins to who we are. So the first panel, group one talks about, and that's the panel that's closest to the um, <clears throat> cross in the front of the sanctuary. The first four panels talk about prophecy and incarnation. So there's a picture of the ark, and it reminds me of the many times that story of Noah and the ark has been told in Sunday school classes. Uh, the second panel has the tongs of the hot coal, which God touched Isaiah's list, unclean lips, so that they could be pure in prophecy of God's coming and glory. The third one uh, talks of the nativity, has a picture of a manger and a star. The fourth one has a dove, <clears throat> a descending dove and water representing Christ's baptism. The second panel, as you move closer toward the back of the church, is about the ministry on earth. And so there's a fish in a net that represents that we're all Christ's call to the disciples that we're to leave everything and follow him. The second one is Cairo, which represents the Sermon on the Mount. The third one is the five loaves and two fish. Sometimes we think, because we're not the biggest church on earth, that there's not much we can do, not much difference we can make, but it's just not true. As Jesus told us in this important story and as Hattie Mae Wyatt demonstrated that much can be done from not, from what seems to be very little. 
The fourth one in this panel is a serpent and staff, which reminds us of the healing miracles of Christ, but it also makes me think that the congregation started hospitals in the city, which became part of Temple, a very important to the city and has helped millions of people, the Temple University Health System, and that we continue to minister to people who are sick. <clears throat> that symbol, the serpent and the staff, is also the modern day caduceus, which is the symbol for medicine, medical community medical professionals. The third group is the uh, Passion and Resurrection set. And this one has, uh, on the first one, it has palm leaves representing Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The third, second one has grape leaves and wheat representing the communion elements of the Last Supper. The third one has a cross, which represents the crucifixion. And the fourth one has the empty tomb with the sun rising, representing his resurrection. And the fourth set of panels, which we don't see so easily because they're back in the offices where Casey and Pastor David sit. But and that, that panel represents the church's work through the ages. And the first one is class tans representing brotherhood, which makes me think of the warmth and the cordiality and the friendship we have in our church. And also makes me think of the brotherhood of the four chaplains. The second one is a ship with a cross for a mast and it is to represent to carrying the gospel to all the lands but it also makes me think of um, the international element we have in our church and how it makes us think beyond ourselves into the bigger world because we know and love people from different parts of the world um, and the uh, last two represent the Alpha and Omega, and it represents God's omnipresence from the beginning throughout all eternity. So that was um, pretty much the chapter on the move to Bluebell. So I will move to missions and ministries. And this is a long list. And so I don't have time to um, go into depth and neither do I in the book. The book's already long enough, but um, we'll touch on a few, but it's certainly been part of our DNA. And just as Conwell said, when he dedicated Temple University, that he wanted this universities to stand, that Christians had started this and that Christianity was a not just an institution of theory, but an institution of practice that we do things to help people. It's in our DNA. We are to be Christ's hands and feet. We are to bring his kingdom to earth. So we have things that minister to those inside the church. And then we have many things that reach out to the community and to the world to help make a difference. So we have uh, our midweek Bible study that meets every week. We have presence, which is a group. There is a picture of them on the up under the title, which is a, a small group that gets together for fellowship, for prayer and Bible study. We have a prayer meeting that meets weekly, uh, also that um, meets for fellowship and sharing pieces of our lives and for, of course, prayer for everything from small things that happen in our life to people, neighbors and friends we're concerned about to things going on the, in the world. We have youth group, we have Brady's Collegiate Ministry, uh, we have Faith in Action, we have Interfaith Hospitality Network, which we're moving into uh, this month. When we bring families in who are in housing transition and we house them in our church, and that's long been called Interfaith Hospitality Network, they're just changing their name to Family Promise of Motco. We have Obed, Obed and Kathy Arango's Sicate, which is a ministry in Norristown helping to serve the Latino community. We have Dwight and Barbara Bolick's work that they've done in Chile with the Mapuche people, helping this indigenous group <clears throat> improve themselves and find different ways of economic improvement from beekeeping to weaving, to girls clubs, to the work Dwight's done with water conservation. We have John Luke Craig and his work he's done with urban poverty that we have to be concerned with not just as Christians, but with humans, that this is a major problem that has many different angles that have to be attacked in order to solve it. We have Nelson and Sandra Hayashida, members who did an important ministry in South Africa. We have the Wissahickon Faith Community Association, which is an interfaith group of ministers that gets together and our ministers have long been involved in that to find ways to serve the community and support each other. We have the Communion Club, we have Lansdale Club, we have REACH work camps that our youth have served in for many years. 
were part of the Philadelphia Baptist Association. We have things like Parents Night Out, Easter egg hunts, not just for our kids, but for the community. We support the Maddie Dixon Food Cupboard. We support the Norristown Breakfast, which is what Ed's doing there in the lower right hand picture. We try to be a good neighbor to the elementary school that's next to us, Shady Grove, and support them, work with the guidance counselors there and provide back to school supplies and clothing as necessary. We've had adult mission trips. After hurricane down in Galveston, we sent a team to help with repairs. We sent a team up to New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy. A group of um, people went down to Maryland. We had members um, that had a friend down there with a ministry, the Bruce Outreach Center. We have a congregational care team that meets with people who can no, no longer come into church and people in the hospital. We have the prayer shawl group. We're part of American Baptist churches. We have Sunday school, Graceland, vacation Bible school, picnics, hayrides, bas baseball games that we go to as family. And we have a flea market and vendor day, which reminds me of those fairs that Conwell and the early congregation held to help keep Temple University afloat. And then our next chapter is the chapter, as I discussed, where we <clears throat> have some excerpts from speeches and sermons that were give given by pastors and also by um, some dignitaries that have graced our pulpit stage. So, and it's interesting just thinking about that pulpit that sits in our narthex for 150 years, how many weddings, funerals, benedictions, uh, prayers that have been said before it. And of course, thinking that all of these men and women have stood behind it. So I'm going to give you just excerpts, uh, a quote or two to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that are in there. So the uh, first one that we have in the book is a New Year's Eve sermon that Conwell ha has given, and he tells us to pay our debts and to those that we owe, and including our debt to God. Helen Keller received an honorary degree from Temple University and stood behind our pulpit and she was so pleased that not only, and this was on February 16th, 1931, and she was so pleased that we not only recognized her, but we also recognized her teacher, Ann Sullivan. So she talks about that. Franklin Delano Roosevelt also received an honorary degree from Temple and stood behind our pulpit. And he talked about, that was on February 22nd, 1936. And he talks, <clears throat> talks about having heard Conwell speak when he was in college, and he heard that famous Acres of Diamonds speech and how Temple University was founded to help people get a college degree who wouldn't otherwise be able to get it. Our seventh pastor, Dan Poling, did a very poetic sermon called Time Enough. And I want to repeat this one to myself sometimes. He talks about a paradise valley lying just over the rim where there is time enough to romp with children to listen to the dreams of daughters and to the hopes of sons. Time enough to ramble in the fields of memory, to know our friends, to talk with Christ. Time enough to do and to dare to live and love. On February 3rd, 1951, Harry Truman stood behind our pulpit in the lower temple in the chapel of the four chaplains at the dedication there. And he said, we commemorate on this day a great act of faith in God. And if we remember our faith in God and live by it as our forefathers did, we need have no fear of the future. On August 4th, 1965, Martin Luther King stood behind our pulpit and he tells us we aren't going to solve injustice by prayer alone. We have to act. In a sermon called In Step with Jesus, our eighth pastor, Norman Paulin, who is current member Lloyd Paulin's father, he charges us to get up and go for Christ, to walk in step with him, to live for him, to love as he loves. Our 13th pastor on February 6, 2013, George Hawthorne, in a sermon called Where Do We Go From Here, gives a very inspirational story as he takes apart the word preach and he gives us a powerful message that we have to join together in ministry 
and use whatever gifts that God has given us and commit them to serve one another, the community, and the world. And we have to do it with enthusiasm. On July 12th, 2020, just a few months, just four months into the pandemic, our two-time interim pastor, Steve Prang, gives us a very interesting and inspirational message as he prepares us for the transition ahead, post-pandemic, post-Black Lives Matter, reopening after COVID and with a new pastor. He reminds us that our job is to follow and trust God and allow our lives to be a blessing to others. August 23rd, 2020, Fred Lewis in in a sermon called His Church Really the Body of Christ reminds us we are all part of the body of Christ and that God has plans for a community like us, a community of faith like us. On January 3rd, 2021, and on New Year's Eve sermon, youth pastor Brady Rennix gives an interesting and a wonderful sermon called Turning the Page, and he says there's always time to start anew. We can flame fire into flame the Holy Spirit within us. Flame, I think we can, yeah. A fan into flame, that is what it is. Fan into flame, the Holy Spirit within us. And then in June 13th, 2021, our current pastor, our 14th pastor, David Branicki, gives a wonderful sermon called Letting Love Flow. And he gives us uh, some ideas on what are the ways we can let God's love flow and continue to let God's love flow. Then we get to the chapter on the future. So uh, I don't have the answers to the future. We don't know what the future is, but we need to consider it. Matthew 6, 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. So there's, that's where we start. But how do we envision a future? But this 150th gives us a unique opportunity to start a new chapter post pandemic with a new pastor and really think about where we're headed and what can we do? And what can we do by following Christ's teaching to make a difference, to be his hands and feet, to bring his kingdom to earth, to be his peacemakers? And what will members 150 years from now think of our plans and our ideas? Isaiah 54 says, he awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. We have to think about our mission statement. Grace Baptist Church is a Christ-centered community sharing God's love with the world. It's hard thinking about the future and plans and what we need to do because guess what? Life is full. We're all very busy, overcommitted. And attending church is even unusual these days. More people don't attend church than do. But we know there's a purpose in attending church. When we're directed in the Bible, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, Matthews 18, 20, we're Colossians 3, 16, we're directed to be a community of faith. <clears throat> For some perspective on the future in the book, I include an interview, uh, some thoughts from Audrey Paleska, a young person in our church, because the future is with our young people. And then I have some thoughts from our current pastor on his ideas about the future. But we need to take the time this year going forward and really think about it with all the lessons we've learned from our predecessors and what we can do if we listen closely to what God would have us do and how much, how committed are we to the church's future? We've experienced the wonders of God's love. How can we take that and bring it to others? Okay, and so from here, I'm going to pause and we'll stop sharing. Let's see. And so I can switch over to the. um, Yes, we'll stop share. And we will share the um, video. And I think we left off last week with, I don't see the 
There it is. Let me pull the cursor back and start at the right place. Okay. Hi, I'm Ed Poluska, and this is me volunteering at a local breakfast for those who are hungry. Our members and friends regularly volunteer and support this program. I am Luke Sharp. Grace Baptist has been one of the churches that provide homeless families shelter for more than 30 years. This is part of Interfaith Housing Alliance, which provides food, transportation, and lodging at area churches for people experiencing homelessness. Hi, I am Oneida Ortiz, and this is the small group we call Presence that meets on Tuesday nights. When COVID started, we began meeting virtually. We met for Bible studies, friendships, and prayer. We call it Presence because we feel God's presence when we're together. I am Carolyn Paulin, and this is our midweek Bible study that meets on Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. Studying the Bible allows an opportunity to better understand our faith. We also get to know one another better and share concerns in prayer. There's also a Thursday evening prayer meeting that started during COVID that meets virtually. I am Brady Renix, and I'm the youth and young adults pastor. We have a great time at the church. For youth group, we have pool parties, we go to amusement parks, we do bowling and go-karts and lunch out. So much fun. We laugh, we play, and most important, we learn how to build our relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm Sophia Dobrovolk. We also have groups that get together to exercise or socialize and have fun. Here's a Grace Baptist biking group. Hi. I'm Jill Ray. This is a photo from one of our communion club gatherings. We get together on the first Friday of each month to socialize and connect. Hi, my name is Casey Brooks and I'm the director of Children and Family Ministries. Here are some pictures of our children performing a Christmas skit at our yearly church Christmas dinner. We have church bonfires, baseball outings, vacation Bible school, Easter egg hunts, trunk or treats, and a variety of activities throughout the year for our children and families at Grace. I am Irene Phillips, and this is me on Zoom. When the COVID-19 pandemic shut down our church in March 2020, we quickly transitioned to live Zoom worship services. I am Savannah Reddix, and here my sisters and I are singing to one of the Zoom services during the pandemic. I am Wendell Branicky, and this is a photo from my dad, Pastor David Branicky's installation service in 2021. Hi, I'm Andrea Rogers. At Pastor Branicky's installation service, two former Grace Baptist pastors joined us. On the far left is two-time interim pastor, Reverend Stephen Crane, and second from the right is Reverend Fred Lewis, our 12th pastor, who served at Grace Baptist for 22 years. I am Madison Doverbollock, and this is a photo of my baptism at Grace Baptist Church in 2021. I am Henry. This photo with members dressed in Eagles jerseys was taken after the 2018 championship. I am Reverend David Branicky. The exciting thing is that the church can write its future. We get to be co-authors with God of the future. If we embrace its opportunities and responsibilities and walk by faith and trust in God. I am Audrey Pulaska. As it celebrates its 150th birthday, Grace Baptist Church has the chance to begin a new chapter. To move towards a better future, we are thinking about what we can do by following the teachings of Jesus Christ to make a difference in the lives of others. How can we be peacemakers and bring his kingdom to earth? I am Isaiah Mark. As we dream of a future for our church, will members 150 years from now, read about our thoughts and marvel at our ambitious vision and question why we didn't dream bigger. I am Frankie. 
Our mission at its core is to offer people paths to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Hi, I'm Scott Brooks. We can adapt and focus and build a bright future for ourselves and others at Grace Baptist of Bluebell. Christ, we in Christ, we must take steps. We walk in faith. I am Ellie Pileska. Romans 8.38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. I am Kelly Gallagher. At our 100th anniversary, Grace Baptist lifted up the following prayer. It still speaks to us today. Our Father in heaven, accept our prayer of thanksgiving for having brought us safely to this point in time. I am Margaret Montgomery. The prayer continued. Our finite minds may not envision all of thy master plan, but we do know that we can't fail in our allotted task if we keep before us the words of Jesus to his disciples, follow me. I am Trish Simpson. As we step forward, we remember Conwell's motto, do the next thing. I am Delaney Mark. As we step forward, we remember that Martin Luther King Jr. said behind our pulpit, take action. We cannot rely on prayer alone. We must be Christ's hands and feet. I am Hannah Dover Falk. As Pastor Steve Crane said in his farewell sermon, Grace Baptist is beginning a new journey to allow God to use our lives to be a blessing and follow God. I'm Lai Wahama. Help us to be your people. Help us to be people of faith. John 4, 7 says, let us love one another, for love comes from God. I am Tamara Phillips. Grace Baptist is strengthened by our history and looks with joy to the future. Psalms 47.1 says, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. I am Jack Sharp. This is our church building in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. This is our story and we are Grace Baptist Church. We hope our stories of love will help you see God's love in your own life. Psalms 115, verse 1. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory because of your love and faithfulness. I am Harry Jenkins III, and six generations of my family have attended Grace Baptist Church. The legacy of love, learning, healing, and service began 150 years ago. And we faithfully and humbly carry on in Bluebell, Pennsylvania. Okay, that was our video. So I thought I can get us back to the presentation now. I think I have to stop share. Okay. Right, so we talked about the future, we saw the video, so I'll take a few minutes before we close up and tell you just at a very high level about the 17 chapters we didn't cover in the book, which were what I call the pews. And so, as I said at the beginning, I interviewed many of the members. Unfortunately, I couldn't get to them all. And besides, this is, book is getting to uh, such an unwieldy size as it is. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'm sorry we couldn't include everyone, uh, but we do have quite a few members uh, stories in the book, as well as former members who stepped up to talk to me. And it was a wonderful blessing in my life, um, sitting at this desk behind this window, looking out when you couldn't get out during the pandemic. And I got to talk to people all over the country and get to know current members better and also hear some wonderful stories from the church downtown. And even though I've never been to a service there other than my son's graduation, uh, it certainly made me feel like I could envision the baptisms, the wonderful, beautiful, majestic baptisms that went, in, went on down at that church and the beautiful uh, detailed descriptions of the temple camp. I feel like I've been to that camp uh, after those descriptions and the stories that were shared. 
and um, and they're just other uh, this these stories have a little bit of everything. I think I say that on the book cover. There's intrigue, mystery, war, uh, death, and love. So I think you'll find uh, certainly um, pinpoints of time in history, in American history, in here from um, people talking about having served in Vietnam to 9-11 uh, uh, moments shared. Um, and like I said, a beautiful, the ministers that we ha uh, have ordained at the church is something uh, wonderful too. I brought up that up in the video, but I'm not sure I brought it up in this um, series of lessons, but some of their stories are uh, there in the book. Chris List, Lister, uh, Jeff Snyder, Abby Huff, for example, uh, are included in there. Uh, but I think you'll enjoy this part. Uh, it was certainly uh, important to me, and I think it's uh, significant to the book. So I will close us today with a prayer, and these were taken taken from, I'm sorry, I just lost my video there. Okay, let's see if I can get it back. Sorry about that. I will um, close this off with <laughs> the words that were shared in the video, but I think um, make a good prayer for us to close off. So if you'll join me in prayer, dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for this time to pause and think about our history and our, what lies ahead of us. As Pastor, <clears throat> as Pastor, um, our interim pastor said in his transition sermon to us, and I'll find my spot here in a second. He said, help us. This is what Pastor Steve said. He said in his farewell sermon, help us to add our names to the heroes of faith so that one day it might be said that Grace Baptist Church had faith by following you. And at our 100th anniversary prayer, it still resonates with us today. Our Father in heaven, accept our prayer of thanksgiving for having brought us safely to this point in time. Our finite minds may not envision all of your master plan, but we do know that we cannot fail in our allotted task if we keep before us the words of Jesus Christ to his disciples. Follow me. Thanks again for joining me, and I'll close off for today. <laughs>